Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! The political battles over Brexit have been furious. The negotiations are complex and fraught. But with a year until our departure, what do voters make of the Brexit progress so far? We've been to Coventry, a city where just over 55% of people voted to leave to meet a group balanced between leave and remain. They were selected for the BBC by the research company Britain Thinks. Our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, was listening in. I just thought it was a straight... Out, you know, goodbye. I don't think anybody knows. I don't think the Prime Minister knows who's mm. going to be the winner. We've left, so let's get on with the leaving. Yeah. For all the political shenanigans, Brexit was a decision taken by the public. What you're about to see isn't scientific, but a slice of opinion, a flavour of the conversations that you, we, are all having around the country about Brexit with a year to go. I think they were really clever with yeah, it's clever with Brexit because, because they, yeah. chose, they chose the two biggest issues yeah. that bother us, the NHS and immigration, absolutely pummeled us yeah. all with that and then didn't give us enough yeah. information as, to stay in, but they, they, they attacked us the, the weaknesses, if you know what I mean. Well, people's yeah. emotions. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. I worked with some fantastic nurses from EU countries. Yeah. Fantastic nurses and doctors, and, if, and without them being able to move freely, mm. we wouldn't have those staff. Mm. But then on the flip side, we're treating so many non-British um, patients that's putting the strain on us. Just not happy about it at all, and it worries me, like the future of kids. I put up Brexit because of the large companies threatening to pull out if we go ahead with it and this is going to happen we're talking thousands of jobs mm -hmm. so it's worrying for everybody because it's not just say a big company it's all like the supply chain and it's a, ri a, a ripple effect yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's billions yeah. of pounds that we're still going to be paying into the eu when we've left mm -hmm. and, and, and they've done a deal and they're going to uh, pay this or pay that and you think where's it all come from where does it go to? Where is this EU market? Simply break it down and say, right, we're going to achieve this with the borders, this is what we're going to do with, the mm. this we're do with Ireland, this is what we're going to do with the economy, this is what we're going to do with the pound. This is mm. Just simple things like that, really. We're arguing with 27 other countries, I think it is, uh, who don't want us to leave. So how on earth are we going to get anything out of it that is advantageous to Britain? That it's nearly two years since we've been left. I don't know why we couldn't have left sooner than we have done. Mm. Most of us have all got children and our main concern is, yeah. is their futures and mm -hmm. by the time my children grow up we will be in full, you know, we will be a country on our own and at what position are we going to be? Mm -hmm. yeah. When votes are required we are promised the world but when we then vote and someone comes into force, um, then nothing happens. Toughen up, stand up for the people of the UK and what's best for them and the country. And uh, yeah, stand up to Brussels and stop pandering to them. Yeah. Don't back down and keep telling us the truth. Uh, start telling us the truth, sorry. Um, and fight for the NHS. Stop beating around the bush. Be strong in what we've decided. Be proud in what we are, who we are. We won't crumble. This is the UK. Some pride, some fears, but impatience too. Brexit was a promise that is not straightforward to keep. Laura Koonsberg, BBC News, Coventry. Campaigners for Brexit are already calling it Independence Day, exactly one year away tomorrow, the moment when Britain formally leaves the European Union. That will be the moment when Britain can start forging its own trade policy. So what are the deals the UK can do with countries across the world and what will they want from us in return? Gary Gibbon has been mapping out the possibilities. One year from tomorrow, the plan is Britain can formally start trade agreement talks around the world. Thank you so much for coming. For some, it was the great dream of Brexit. We asked two trade experts what this brave new world could look like. And is it worth it? Starting with the free trade agreement most talked about, the one with the United States. We're working on a trade deal, which would be a very, very big deal, very powerful deal, great for both countries. 
The big prize for the US, the chance to sell agriculture, including hormone-fed beef and chlorine-washed chicken, into the UK market, where EU rules right now ban them. You get a benefit from a trade agreement and open up your markets, not just for your expo exporters reciprocally, but also for your importers and your consumers who get to buy p cheaper, better value, greater choice, greater competition. We've got this trade agreement with the US, potentially, and to get it we've had to concede on the issues we've just been talking about, so chickens that have been dipped in chlorine, uh, beef that's been grown, or cows that have been grown with hormones. And the issue there is that this is going to be an aggressive demand of the US. If we want a trade agreement with them, we're going to have to do it and concede. However, it also means we have to have a much bigger rupture with the European Union. Some argue Britain has to choose whose orbit it wants to be in. Essentially, you've got two power blocks in the world where it comes to regulation. You've got the EU and you've got the US. And then on the rise, you have China. So, so it might be one day, it's not there yet. And actually when you look at who is the regulatory superpower of the world, it's the European Union. So over time, after we leave, we have a choice either, either to stay sort of voluntarily within that orbit and ensure that new barriers don't go up, or take our chances and perhaps pivot towards the US. But in doing so, we will inevitably uh, induce greater barriers to trade with the European Union and there's some big questions about whether it's worth it. I think it's interesting that um, Sam seems so happy that the regulatory structures of the slowest growth region of the world That's not true. are being exported to areas w which are you know have had the the highest growth. Brexiteers argue on new technologies areas like artificial intelligence driverless cars Britain needs to escape the EU's over-cautious approach to regulations. One of the arguments that some people um, use, though, is that um, the yeah. regulatory orbit that we're in at the moment, the European uh, way of regulating things, is particularly uh, sclerotic and slow when it comes to all the new industries that yeah. could be huge parts of our growth in, in the, the future. future. And I think, I think there's some truth there. That it, we should that maybe be leaning into the American orbit there. That might actually help us. Well, so, so the issue the UK has here is that there is some truth in that, that it's been, the EU's been a bit slow moving and a bit inflexible when it comes to regulating in these areas and catching up and creating sort of incentives for their development. But the issue the UK has is we get these new industries through, through, through their infancy because we take a different approach to regulation. At some point the EU will regulate on this and we're still going to want to sell, sell into that market. So at that point, on issues like data, on issues like standards, we're going to end up having, needing to conform in order to actually make any money off these products because the UK market, market isn't big enough to sustain them, to sustain their production at scale on its own. The gains from improving our domestic regulatory environment are potentially much greater than the losses from border barriers, especially in technology. Exports in legal and financial services could be boosted if we get the promised free trade agreements in the world's fastest growing markets. The big growth opportunities, the big growth opportunities are with the US, India, China. Interest in financial services is huge. Now what would India want from us? The obvious one that everyone always says is they want, um, they want mode four services, they want visa liberalisation for their um, IT professionals and engineers and, and students. And, and, and India just doesn't really want to do anything on that. It's, it's not that interested in free trade agreements for the most part. India and China both got talked about quite a bit during the referendum as these two giant opportunities. There's things you can do at the margins, but in terms of getting a fully fledged free trade agreement, it's not impossible, especially with China. You can get one with China. It's just not going to be very substantial in regards to concessions made by China towards the UK. They might get everything they want. They're a big country. Further to the east are the stars of the referendum speeches. The sooner we re-engage with a broader Commonwealth, the better as a nation of the world will be. New Zealand would be very keen to get rid of the quota system on lamb, similar from um, Australia, who would also like to sell us more of their beef. We're taking in cheaper agriculture and more of it from them. 
in and, return for and in return with selling them anything or just sending over we, some tourists we get we get to say that we have a trade agreement with New Zealand and Australia and we can put it on Liam Fox's mantelpiece and say look we've done something well the other um, interest that we would have of course is visa liberalization so that we can you know there are more British people in Australia I believe than live in the whole of the rest of the 27 EU countries so if we could make it easier for British and Australian and New Zealand um, citizens to come and work in each other's countries that would be a very popular move on on all sides I would have thought yeah I think one of the issues when we're talking about these sorts of things and you can see it quite clearly on the map is that we're over there <laughs> Australia and New Zealand are over there the countries still trade with those countries near them and especially if they're big economic units like the EU more than they do with a small island in the middle of the Pacific Many of the potential deals seem to promise cheaper food imports. Cheaper prices for British consumers. Protection of our agricultural sector is going to be on the altar in a lot of these negotiations. Sacrificial lamb, so to speak. <laughs> well, I would certainly agree that protection of our agriculture is something that um, you know, is, will, will need to be looked at and will be up for negotiation. However, that doesn't mean to say that the industry itself is being sacrificed because unprotected agricultural systems can and do work very well. And they might not look at it that way, our farmers. Uh, uh, well, as I, I, I think they do. I've, I've spoken to many farmers who actually are very looking forward, very much looking forward to the opportunity of being freed from some of the administrative burdens of the common agricultural policy. I think we'll see that when we start talking about trade agreements with Australia, with New Zealand, we're going to we're going to be on a bit of a period in a bit of a period of political price discovery, where it when we find out how strong is our farming lobby, and I would argue that the UK probably isn't as free trade as we like to portray ourselves. In decades of EU membership, Britain proclaimed itself the free trade visionary. Will it now embrace the reality? Gary Kibben, well, I'm joined now by Lord Price, a former international trade minister, and from Washington by Ambassador Miriam Sapiro, a former US trade representative under President Obama. Ambassador, looking in from there, do you think Britain can be better off away from the European Customs Union or, or it would be safer to just try and negotiate something similar to what we've got now? I think the UK is going to try to have it both ways. To continue to have a very close partnership with the EU. The Prime Minister's speech earlier this month talked about a customs partnership. And at the same time, do what it can to forge new agreements with the United States, Australia and other countries. Right, but when, the, when they have to choose, and they will have to choose on key issues, should they side with America and Australia and India, or should they say we're safer sticking with Europe? Well, from the U.S. perspective, it would be great if there could be a strong U.S.-EU trade agreement that reflects the highest levels of liberalization. And I think both economies have been built on trade and have a very healthy respect for free trade, while at the same time trying to protect those workers that could be affected. But at the same time, you have to look at the reality, and that is that the largest market for the UK right now is the EU. And the UK is one of the largest markets for the EU. So I really don't think it's realistic to talk about a break with the EU in terms of trade. And I think, I think Downing Street is recognizing that reality and trying to find a way to maintain the EU rules or I would rather say to ensure that the UK rules are absolutely consistent with as high, if not higher, than the EU rules. OK, Lord Price, but you, you were negotiating... Let, let me just bring in Lord Price in the studio. You were working on this up until a few months ago. Yet when you resigned, having been a Remainer, you were saying, well, you know, these deals with all these other countries are not going to be that difficult. Uh, I don't think I ever said they wouldn't be difficult. Uh, what I said is that our first priority is to get our own schedules with the WTO. Then we need to get a comprehensive free trade agreement with the EU. Then we need to make sure that all of the deals that we have now through the EU with 60 odd countries are maintained. And then it's about new trade deals. And the Prime Minister has announced nine working groups with different countries, including the USA, uh, which is very exciting. And that work will start in earnest when we leave the EU in March next year. And do you think it's worth it, ultimately, that we'll be better off, or could be better off, 
I, at the end of I, the process? Yes, I do. I think we're going to go through a few years when things are going to be chaotic. There's a lot to do. But ultimately, I do think we will get to a good place with the EU. I think it's in both of our interests. On day one, uh, we're going to import EU regulation into the UK. That's what's going through the uh, Parliament at the moment. And also, both sides have said that they'd rather not apply tariffs. But then on top of that, we can look outwards. We can look at the countries that you've mentioned in your uh, VT. But we can't ride both horses, can we? I mean, we do come up against foreign-aided chicken uh, and all those sorts of issues. Well, the reality now is that businesses ride lots of horses. So when I ran weight trades for 10 years, we exported to 60 countries around the world. Even in the EU, we had to meet different labelling regulations in different countries. But also for America, we had to reformulate or repackage. What I hope is that going forward, we make it easier for businesses to do business by reducing tariff rates, by looking at where we can reduce bureaucracy and red tape. And there's no reason why a business in the UK can't supply partners in America as well as partners in the EU. Ambassador, do you think America sees or smells Britain's weakness and that in any trade deal, uh, Donald Trump's going to seek to exploit that? Well, I do think the UK has a bit less leverage given the size of its market. It's no longer part of the 500 million consumers that would be uh, in a US-EU TTIP type of agreement. At the same time, I do think Washington is very interested in trying to do a trade agreement. Uh, that, again, would help liberalize standards on both sides of the Atlantic, and that London and Washington will see more eye-to-eye -eye than, I think, Washington and Brussels have in the past. Um, Lord Price, just simply, why can't Britain just try and stick with all the agreements that are within the customs union at the moment and say, going forward, we'll just, we'll just have the same deals? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that make, make us safer? Uh, well... The plan is, as set out by the Prime Minister, that all of the deals that we currently have will be imported into the UK. And those governments have said that they would want to do that. They would want to make sure there's no cliff edge and we continue. The prize is that we can do that, and then we can start working on new trade agreements with America, with Australia and with New Zealand. Uh, and I very much agree with what's been said, that there is certainly a sentiment in America uh, with the regulators there, with the president, that they really want to do a trade deal with the UK. And both sides wanting to do something is probably the key requirement in making sure that happens. Lord Price, Ambassador Sapiro, thank you both very much. <laughs>